How many know that's how you start church, right? Wow. I was uh, probably singing louder than any one of you, and so I just want to say shame on you that you weren't singing as loud as me. So, uh, well, we're excited you're here. Uh, a, a full house is always awesome to see. What's more amazing to see, uh, that blows my mind, is how people respond to God, and, and to see people coming and kneeling, unprovoked, just kind of coming and saying, you know what, God, there's more. There's more for me. And so my prayer is, and our prayer every single week is, we just kind of open up our doors, and we want to create an environment where you can encounter a God who loves you and cares for you and has an incredible plan for your life. Whether this is your first time here, whether this is your hundredth time here, that you have an opportunity today. And so uh, it was just amazing to see that. Before I dive into what we are talking about, I just want to kind of put this out there and I want all of us to be on guard. Uh, It's crazy the climate and the culture that we are living in. And I believe there is an all out assault from the enemy to bring division, to bring division into families, to bring division into marriages, to bring division into friendships, to bring division into churches. And and it's it's wreaking havoc and you see so many people falling prey to it. So I want to let you know as this church, we're going to stand on guard for relationships. We're going to stand on guard. We're going to be wise to the enemy's schemes, to his plans and to his purposes. And you know what? When you sense that division coming, you just say, "Uh uh-uh, not here, not today, devil. You've (laughs) You've got no authority here. And, and you guard your, your families and you guard your marriages and you guard your friendships and you guard your church again. And so uh, we'll be talking more about that next week. But I just really feel that that is something that means to be warranted and spoke out uh, a whole lot more when I see what is going on in, in our midst. So look at your neighbor and say, hey, I'm on guard for you. Today we're actually starting a brand new series called uh, Hashtag True Love. Figured it's Valentine's, it's, it's, it's the love month, and, and everyone kind of gets on board with that and gets all gooey and mushy. Is there any mushy people here? Is there, is there any people that you just love snuggling and cuddling? That's, that's weird. We got some feedback coming, so is it we all good on that, or do I need to change microphones? It's ringing. It's ringing. <laughs> it's ringing. Do I, do, do I need to change mics, Roy? Yeah. Wow. Rick, do you have that mic here? I'll take that one. I'll turn this one off. Yeah. Check. Is that better? Yeah. My booming radio voice. Hello. Oh. <laughs> and that one's getting some feedback, too. Okay. We're good? Good? Okay. Well, we're starting this brand new series called Hashtag True Love. And our heart over these next couple weeks is you understand how important relationships are. And uh, when, when we hear something like this, well, great, I'm not in a relationship, so does this even apply to me? Is this even going to be applicable? Do I even need to listen? Yeah, actually you do, because what we're going to share over these next couple weeks are, call, call them goals, but today starting with a foundation that I believe every relationship should be built on. And so whether you're kind of married, whether you're engaged, whether you're dating or whether you're single, what I'm going to talk about today is a foundation that every single one of your relationships should be built on. And so I want you to to listen up and we're going to dive into a portion of scripture. We're going to look at God's heart for relationships. God actually had a plan for relationships. Does he talk about them? Yeah, he does way back in the beginning on how it should happen. And so that's where we're going to go. So online, you're going to come on this journey with us. If you're here. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 2, the very beginning of uh, of the Bible. Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to read 18 to 24, and it says this, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. How many love that? So good. Just right for him. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. And then verse 23, At last... At last, maybe they say it like, at last, my love's come. No, just, just. Uh. Yeah. 
They, they pay me to preach, not to sing. And so, <laughs> at last, the man exclaimed, this is, this is uh, one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken from the man. And this explains why a man leaves his mother and father and is joined to his wife, and the two are united in one. Now, here it is. God's heart is for relationships. He even said, it's not good for man to be alone. And he says he caused the man to fall into a deep sleep and he, and he created this incredible uh, partner, this incredible wife to be for the man and, uh, and he brought her to him when the, when the time was right. And the reality, when we look at relationships, the world has a lot to say about relationships and how you have right relationships. And you go to any, any bookstore or get onto Amazon and, and talk about relationship help and the books that you can find, book after book on how to have the proper relationship and how do you have that hashtag true love that everybody is looking for. And the sad reality is a lot of us end up looking at social media for our advice. Can I tell you, if you're doing that, stop it. It's not good. It's not healthy for you. And I did that. You look at, if you did just took the hashtag true love and you were to search Instagram, you begin to find there are 24.9 million posts on people saying, hey, this is what true love is. And they're all different things. And, and here's the deal. It's, it's not truth. It is not truth. You look at this carefully planned, maybe this edited moment. Somebody's walking and saying, wait a minute, look at the sun. We're holding hands and our hands are actually like, they're not just cupping, they're interdigitation. We're in love. They're like, they're just perfect. We got to take this photo with the sun in our hands so we can let people know what hashtag true love is. And then the couple goes to take the photo. And you know this, you've done this. Well, no, no, put your hand like this. No, put it this way. And there's fighting and, and just to create that perfect moment, it's all a lie. I'm thankful that there's maybe some genuine stuff out there, but there is a lot of stuff. It's a lie. And, and I've sat, and my wife and I, we've sat with so many couples when they're engaged and beginning this process of wanting and maybe enter a dating relationship or enter uh, getting married. And you ask them, what they want. What are they looking for in a relationship? And they're like, I want that. I, I want that. I want what I see on social media. I want that. You know, I want, I want, I want to be nice. I want us to go for nice bike rides that we're going to get those tandem bikes, you know, those two seater bikes and we're going to ride and we're going to pedal and stride together. It's going to be beautiful and we're going to do it. It's going to be awesome. That's, that's what we want. I want them to be able to take the photo shoot in our matching pajamas, our onesie pajamas and our, our brand new comforter that we bought from home sense on our barn board, uh, uh, headboard. It's just going to be so great. That's, that's what I'm looking for. I want us to slow dance, when we make every meal together, when we eat together, every time in the kitchen, we, we're going to slow dance. And you're like, really? <laughs> that's, that's what you're, that's what you're looking for. And I'm actually thankful that people crave a whole lot of stuff. I'm thankful that people crave more and they crave different and they, and they crave special in relationships, but that's not reality. And I, I, I'm going to share from my perspective and from, from what I've experienced in my relationship. I'm so thankful that God has given me an incredible gift in my wife, Melissa. She's amazing. I love her. She's awesome. Yeah. And I believe, I believe with all my heart what we have. I don't care what you think. It's not about you right now. It's about me. It's my moment. We have, honestly, I, I think it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's a God-ordained relationship uh, that is far better than anything that I could have ever imagined when I said yes almost 25 years ago. That what we have seen happen in our life. And, and I can promise you with all of my heart, my, my wife, my bride is my best friend. There's nobody else I would rather spend time with. And, and uh, I'm not a very, if you were to ask my family, I'm not an emotionally available person. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so I'm not one of those ooey, gooey, gushy, cuddly, and my wife is like, can you give me a massage? I'm like, really? Can I just pay for you to go get a massage? They can do it way better than I can, right? That's love. That's true love right there. That's hashtag true love. But you know what? We serve God together. We, 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 we are blessed in ministry together. We have a unified vision for our life, for our family together. We have a rich spiritual life together. Uh, and it's better than ever, anything that I could ever imagine. We have absolute trust. There's a rich, deep commitment. There's an understanding of the covenant that we entered into, not just in good times, but you remember your marriage vows. If you're married, it's that in good times and bad. How many know there's bad times? 
in relationships. If you're married, you're like, oh, heck yeah. I, I know that for sure. And uh, the amazing thing, what I'm discovering in my relationship with my wife is that daily we fall more in love with each other. Daily, we're falling more in love with each other. Now, before you roll your eyes, you're like, great, did I come to a Hallmark special today at church? Like, what the heck is this all about? And, and the cheesy love affair. What I want to share with you is to help you understand that, that what we have, it's not about a destination. It's about a journey. It's not about arriving at that place where you're perfect in your marriage, where you're perfect in your relationships. It's understanding that our relationships, they're a journey. It's not a destination we arrive at, but it's a, but it's a journey that we take every day. Because I can tell you, if you didn't know it, my wife is a redhead. How many know that's a whole different ball game? Right? She's, she's demanding, she's fiery, she's fierce, she's vocal. When on the flip side, there's me, I'm stubborn, I'm not vocal, I have a very long fuse. I'm like, huh, whatever. She, she is, tends to kind of let people know right in the moment, I kind of withdraw. I'm a little bit different, I withdraw. Uh, our road in our relationship, I can share this, is, is not been all highs. There's been miscommunications in our marriage. There's been misunderstandings. There's been hurt feelings. There's been intense conversation. And that's preacher words for fights. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, we, we, we fight. Maybe there's been a slamming of a cupboard door or two. Uh, and, but that's under the blood and that's under the grace, right? We fought about things like you all fight about. We fought about our house. We fought about like junk in our house. We fought about how you load the dishwasher, how you don't load the dishwasher, how my wife drives, how I drive, how to discipline kids, worship style. We fight about the temperature of the house. She's like, it should be at this temperature. I'm like, no, it should be at this temperature. And then it's, maybe I shouldn't share this with you because I'll let you in on my little secret. We have one of those smart thermometers. And, uh, and when she turns it up, sometimes I just get on my phone and I turn it back down. We fight about where to eat, what to eat, how to eat, you know, all those things. But here's the amazing thing that I've discovered about our relationship. When we let Jesus into the picture, things changed. Things changed. And it wasn't my wife that changed. It was me. It was me that changed. I was the one that changed. And, and we are nowhere close to where we started in our relationship when we, when we first said yes. We're nowhere close to that. When I look at the guy that I was back then, I'm like, oh my goodness, I was a jerk. I was like horrible. I, I, I was not a nice guy. And I look at what God is doing and what's happening. We're on a journey. We haven't arrived yet. We're still on a journey and daily God is refining us. And the beautiful thing is, as we're keeping Jesus in the center of it all, we're falling more in love with each other. We're falling more in love with each other. And when you look at normal relationships today, just take a look. Just take a look in your sphere of influence, normal relationships today. You'll see a lot of theory out there. Hey, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. But what you actually see is a lot of hurt feelings. You see a lot of bitterness. You see a lot of frustration. You see a lot of mistrust. You see a lot of fights about different things like money. You see a lack of unity in couples on how they're going to raise their kids. You see kind of two people actually doing their own thing. Two people actually doing their own thing without any kind of common vision. And they wonder why there's frustration and discouragement. And that's why I wanted to start this series and, and take this journey. Not just because it's February, because God loves relationships. Because he loves relationships and he wants to see your relationships. He wants to see them healthy. He wants to see them prospering. He wants to see them, man, just full of life and, and love. And that's why we're doing this. And so, so today, the foundation that we're going to lay is simple. Doesn't matter if you're married, doesn't matter if you're dating, you're engaged, or you're single, or if you've got friendships, whatever it is, we need to understand that our relationships, wherever they are, need to be Christ centered. That's the foundation for everything. Your relationships need to be Christ-centered. Now, let me say this. Just because you come to church doesn't mean you live a Christ-centered life. 
Yeah, that, that, that's the truth. Just because you say, hey, I'm excited. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to that, that, that church in, in, in Vanier. That doesn't mean you live a Christ-centered life. Just because you serve doesn't mean you live a Christ-centered life. So what does it mean to have a Christ-centered life? Well, that's a, I think it's a fair question. And, and I think that we need to start with, no matter what our relational status is, that our lives are centered around something. Our lives are actually centered around something. If you're married, maybe you like get centered around your spouse. You got kids, maybe it's centered around your kids. I think we need to answer that question first. What is your life centered around? And they're not bad things, right? They're not bad things. Yeah, I want a, I, I want a healthy uh, relationship with my wife. And so, yeah, I'm going to put some attention there. I'm going to put some focus there. Um, but I think we need to start acknowledging that maybe our lives are centered around a whole lot of other stuff and not Christ. Not around even bad things, even good things, but where Jesus is not really the center of it all, that he's not the focal point of our relationships. Because here's what you hear so often in relationships, whether people are young and, and maybe you're on that journey. It's like, man, if I could just find the one. You ever hear that? Oh my goodness, if I could just find the one, that, that is going to be amazing. I'm just waiting for that one. I'm just waiting for that one right guy, that one right girl. I'm just waiting for the one who is going to fulfill me, who's going to make my life complete. If I find that one, then I'm good. Right? And, and God, if it is the one, make sure he's got like rock solid abs and, and, and make sure she's got long flowing hair. You know that one, right? God, if you just bring me the one, then I'm going to be fulfilled. Then I'm going to be filled and, and the two will become one. And here's what I hope you begin to realize. And I want to communicate with you today. Bare bones, as simple as it is, as simple as it is. I would love for you to recognize that you don't need somebody else to complete you. You don't. You don't need somebody else to complete you. Does that mean I'm against relationships? Absolutely not. Absolutely I'm not. Do you know that single is a whole number? It's a whole number. When I look at the life of Jesus, he lived a single life and he did pretty good. Right? He did pretty good. He was able to fulfill God's mission and, and all the plans that he had. So you don't need another person to complete you. Why? Because Jesus completed you. Because Jesus, he's the author, he's the perfecter of your faith. He is the one. And when uh, in a Christ-centered relationship or a marriage, Jesus needs to be your one. He is the one. He's the only one. And then whoever is your, your spouse, your, your, your partner, whoever you're engaged to, they become your number two, not your number one. See, you're already completed when you understand who you are in Christ. And somebody just gets to come along for that journey and you get to do life together. And I would love for, for people one day to say, hey, I'm not waiting for my one. I'm waiting for my two. I'm waiting for my number two. What do you mean your number two? Well, Jesus is my number one. And I'm waiting for my number two. I'm waiting for my number two. Because that's what it is to be in a Christ-centered relationship. He, if we're not good with Jesus... It doesn't matter what relationship comes your way. It doesn't matter how dreamy he is, how drop dead gorgeous she is. It doesn't matter what type of car they drive, how much money they have. If Jesus is not your one, you'll never be satisfied. You will never, ever be satisfied. You will always be looking and longing and saying something is lacking from my relationship because you're going to begin to put that on your, 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 your husband, your wife, your, your, your partner, whoever it is. You're going to say, you're not meeting my needs. And the reality, what do we see? So many marriages ending in divorce. And let's just say, well, that's just outside the world. No, 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 it's in the church too. The divorce rate inside the church, you know what? It's just as high as outside of the church. That tells me, hey, we got a problem that Jesus is not number one. That our relationships, they're probably not Christ-centered. Because when I read what Jesus said, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Right? Right? So does that mean that we're going to have problems in our marriages? In our 
Yeah, absolutely. But nothing is impossible. That, that if Christ is our center, then I believe that we can work through things. We can go that. We can go to those places. And, and again, there's a whole lot of, we're not going to go down that track, but what about this and what about this? We're not answering that. Today, we're looking at, are our relationships Christ-centered? Because that's where it's got to start. That's where it's got to start. And in fact, when you read what it says in Matthew chapter 22, what Jesus is teaching here in verses 36 to 37, it says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Period. That's where it starts. That's the most important thing to do is that we love Jesus with all our heart our soul, and our mind. That he is the focal point of everything we do and of who we are. And you're suddenly thinking, well, what about everything else? Here's the amazing thing. When that is in order, everything else is taken care of. When you get that one right, it's your every relationship you have is going to be in good health. It's going to prosper. It's going to be amazing. When Christ is the foundation that's why the scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things I'm going to add unto you. I'm going to give this all to you. So don't worry about it. God knows your heart. It's not good for man to be alone. So I'm going to make a helper. So why the importance of being Christ centered? Because usually what is at the center of your life is what forms your values. It's what forms your beliefs and shapes your beliefs. What kind of determines your actions and your decisions it impacts your influence and how you're going to kind of flesh that out maybe in your family, maybe with your kids, maybe with your faith. What is at the center is so important. And that's why Jesus said it starts with me. It starts with God right there. That's the baseline. That's where it all starts. And, and some of you are thinking, well, I'm not married yet. So why does this even apply to me? Like, come on, I, this, I, I'm not even in a relationship right now. Tell you, you want a Christ-centered marriage in the future, you start living a Christ-centered life today. You don't wait. Well, you know what? I'll just wait. Because that sad reality, that's what I'll just, you know what? I'll deal with all my stuff later. Right now, it's me time. Right now, I'm living my life. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to do what I want to do. Hey, it's not, it's, hey, it's only a little bit of porn. It's only a little bit of lust. I'm just going to do my own thing. And then all of a sudden you bring that into a relationship. How many lots of train wreck waiting to happen? So you don't wait. You want a Christ centered marriage in the future. You start living a Christ centered life. Now you don't kind of wait. You start to do it. Now you don't build a, a life of righteousness on a, on a, on a, uh, in the future on a foundation of sin today. Because that's what so many of us do. Well, hey, it's, it's okay. It's only a little bit thing. It's only a little thing. When I look at our lives for my wife and I, for 24 years now, we've been on this journey living a Christ-centered life. And uh, it, it started off rocky and, and, and shaky. And I can tell you a lot of things. I can tell you a lot of things and, and write a list. And, and maybe we can even write a book together on, on the things that you need to do to have a healthy relationship, to have a Christ-centered relationship. You need to submit to one another. You need to, you need to forgive one another. You need to honor one another. You need to respect one another. You need to go to church with one another. You need to serve together. You need to dive into the Bible and, and, and read it together. I could ask you to do three things, but most of you probably wouldn't, right? It's just, just being honest. You're like, oh yeah, that's good. Oh, you want me to do something? Whew, that's asking a lot. <laughs> yeah. Is it time to go yet? Right? Best way. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you one thing. How many can handle one thing? Look at your neighbor and say, listen up online. Lean in because this is good. The best way, the best way that you can begin to live a Christ-centered life, the best way that you can succeed in your relationships, wait for it, this is so deep and it's so profound. It's better than a Dr. Phil moment. It's better than any Oprah moment, right? It's better than any of that. If you could do this one thing, pray together. Pray together. You're like, what? That's it? Yeah, pray together. Start there. 
Can I tell you, it's one of the most difficult things to do. We think, well, that's, that's easy. I, 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 we can pray together. I, I believe that couples that pray together stay together. I'm I'm, I'm a firm believer. Couples that pray together, they stay together. If you were here last night, my wife and I actually took a photo because we just expounded on that. And we were actually both vacuuming the church and I had a cool backpack vacuum and she had one. And so someone took a photo and we said, couples that vacuum together, stay together. (laughs) But if you could do one thing as a couple, pray. Pray together. Make it a a point to pray together. I promise you, every single one of you can pray. But it's difficult. And I'm going to be the first one to say I understand how hard it is. How hard it is. And because I still struggle to make it a priority to pray with my wife. We pray all the time. We, We have a very healthy relationship. We're praying as individuals all the time. But I still don't initiate enough praying with my wife. And that's on me. That's not on her. That is on me. And why is it so important that you begin to pray with your wife or if you're in a relationship? Why is it so important to pray? Because I'm telling you, it's hard to fight when you know you're going to pray together. (laughs) Guys, you got a lust problem, a porn problem. It's hard to to look at porn when you know you're going to pray with your your wife or or your girlfriend or your your, 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 uh, fiance. It's hard to hate when you know you're going to pray. It's hard to do all of those things. And it's, it's incredible because we've all been in those places where we've in our relationships, there's tension and and you know it when you go to bed at night and it's not even, there's the line that's drawn in the bed and you're back to back. And you're like, if your toe even crosses that line tonight, (laughs) right? It's no way you keep your cold toes on the other side. We've all been there. We've all been there, but it's harder to remain there when you know that you're going to pray. When you know that, okay, we, we, we got to pray together. And when you do that, you begin to develop this incredible, amazing experience where you are bringing God right into your relationships. And how many know that's a good thing? That is an incredible thing when when Jesus is the center and the best way for him to be at the center is to pray. And again, to to develop that discipline, to to do it every single day. I'm telling you, it's hard. It's easy. Well, it's an easy thing. I can do it. Okay, let me know how you did next week. Right? Because life is going to creep in and, and there might be babies crying and there, and there might be things to do. And then you're going to come upstairs and, 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 and your spouse is already up there and they've fallen asleep or, or you can't get a hold of them. And you, you kind of, it happens. Busyness and life sets in, it just happens. But we need to determine, you want to have that healthy relationship, that Christ-centered relationship. It starts by the simplicity of praying together. And let me, let me give you a couple of tips on how to pray with your spouse. Hopefully this is going to help. Number one, keep it short, right? It doesn't have to be long. You'll have to try to impress your spouse with how long you can pray. God, oh, you're such a good God. And oh, dear Lord Jesus, oh, you're so good. And today I'm just so thankful Oh, you're good. And we go on and on and on. So keep it short. It doesn't have to keep it consistent. Keep it consistent. Do it every single day. Set a time to do it and and, and block off that time and make that time. But keep it consistent. And if you miss a day, don't miss two. This is not legalism. It's not like your spouse. If you're going to be the spouse that's got the checklist, uh, dear You've missed praying with me three days in a row. That's almost grounds for divorce. (laughs) No, we don't do that, right? If you miss a day, don't miss two. Don't miss two. But you'll be be amazed. The more that you do it, the easier it's going to get. It's going to become part of your routine. You're going to do it together. And here's a simple prayer. And and some people, I'll make this available to you. Um, And if you want it, just email me. Send me a Facebook message, whatever. I will send you this prayer. Just a simple prayer. 
Just a simple prayer that you guys can pray over each other every single day. And here it is. Dear God, give us wisdom and clear direction in all that we do today. Help us to show your love to each other and then to shine your light into the world that we're walking into. Keep us close to you. Keep us away from temptation and always in your will. We ask this today in your wonderful name. Amen. How hard was that? How hard was that? When my wife and I pray together, we pray about a bunch of different things. I don't want you to think that, oh my goodness, they don't pray at all. No, no, we, we, when we do pray together, we're praying about different things. We might pray for time with our family, for the church, for people in the church, and all of those things. But I, we need to develop more of a discipline. We're making it a daily connection to pray with each other. It's good that you pray on your own, and that's amazing. Keep that up. But I'm telling you, man, you want a healthy, Christ-centered relationship? Pray together. Pray together. Keep Jesus at the center of it all. What if you're not married? What if you're not in a relationship? What are you doing? You pray. You pray saying, okay, God, this is what I'm believing for in my future spouse. These are the characteristics that I would like to see in my husband, in my wife. That you begin to bring that to God and you begin to pray for your spouse. And instead of looking to Instagram for what you want, I want that, and I want that, and I want that, why don't you dive into God's Word and begin to pray the Scriptures. Jump into Proverbs 31, guys, and say, read Proverbs 31 and say, there's my girl. Right? There is my girl. That's the one. And you begin to pray into, into those things. and Because a lot of people, again, you ask them, what do you want? Well, I want a life full of intimacy. And, and I want adventure and romance. And I want us to whisk around the world. It's funny, when you sat down with us, if we were, when we were first married, we thought by the age at our 25th anniversary, like we would no kids at home. We'd be sailing the Mediterranean. And, and now here we are pastoring you guys. <laughs> but we love you. Right? We love you. We love you. Well, it's got to be full of passionate expression and all that. In reality, what happens is we forget the other side. There's trials, there's pain, there's disappointments, there's heartbreak, there's forgiveness, there's healing. There's all of that stuff that comes along too. And if we're not praying together, and if you're not living a Christ-centered life, that stuff will wreck and ruin and crush every relationship you're in. It, it will. It will wreak so much havoc. And the reality is, when we look at this world that we live in, when we look at the, the enemy's heart to divide, and that is with relationships, and, and the biggest thing that he wants to divide is families. And the biggest thing that he wants to divide is husband and wives, because he knows if that gets, and then the family's going to be fractured, and that's going to spill over into every relationship. So how do we have good relationships, healthy relationships. We keep them Christ-centered. Jesus needs to be the center of everything. And remember, your relationship is not a destination. It's not like, okay, we're good. We've arrived. We were, we've arrived. We've got to that place where everything is good and everything is perfect. No, no, no. You know what? You got to do it all again the next day. You got to do it all again the next day. You continue to go to that place where, where Jesus is leading you every single day. If you're on your own, you need to know that Christ is for you. He's with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And, 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 and I believe, I'm a firm believer that sometimes God brings somebody across our path when the time is right. But what happens if that never happens? Your life is never fulfilled in another person. It's fulfilled in Christ. Amen. And until Christ is enough... I think you're always going to be in that place looking. And when you're looking for somebody else to fulfill what only Jesus can do, you're truly missing out on the most amazing life that Jesus has for you, Amen. that he has for you. He's, he's constantly, he's praying for you. He's with you. He's directing you. He's working in all things to bring good about it for those who, who love him. When I, when I look at a marriage and we think that our life is going to be better when we get married, that life will be perfect when we get married. It's going to be awesome. You think about what a marriage is. It's taking two broken people with the two sets of problems because that's reality. Believe it or not, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all a sinner. So we, we're, we're taking that and we're bringing it together. Her sin, my sin, and, and now we're in this together. So two broken people, but it's amazing what God does for redemption, for restoring, for, for renewing. The best way to experience hashtag true love 
is keeping everything Christ-centered. Is understanding that there's nobody that loves you more. There's nobody that wants better for you than Jesus himself. And when he is at the center of everything, that changes everything. That changes everything. And so I think what's happening today, if you're married, you're, you're beginning to realize that maybe your marriage is not Christ-centered. You're looking at all those things and so, well, I've been, yeah, my, it's been centered around this, it's been centered around this, but Jesus really hasn't been the center of it all. Maybe if you're in a, an engaged relationship, you're, you're, you're looking and saying, yeah, is Jesus the center? Have we made him the focal point of our relationship? Maybe you're in a dating relationship and maybe it's, you, 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 you've had a pattern of dating relationships looking for that one. Can I tell you, you'll never be content until Jesus is your one. You'll never be content till Jesus is your one. So a lot of us, maybe you're single and you're even saying, yeah, my life is not even Christ-centered. I'm not even in a relationship. The reality is that's where it starts for everyone. It starts everyone. And here's the truth. We're not made right with God by, by serving, by giving, by doing all of those things that we're taught. Hey, hey, be, just be a good person person. No, that's not it. We're only made right by his grace. We're only made right by his incredible grace, by, by the shed blood of Jesus. When, when, when he died for the sin of humanity, like I said, we're all sinners, right? Every single one of us, even you online. Yes, you're a sinner too. I'm a sinner. We all have sinned and fall short of God's incredible glory, but God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us so that our sin could be dealt with and we can have relationship. God is a relational God. He desires relationship at the core of who he is. And it starts with a relationship with him. Then when that's right, every other relationship is going to be healthy. Doesn't mean it's not going to have problems. Doesn't mean it's not going to have highs and lows, but it will be healthy. So what do we got to do then? If our life is not Christ centered, well, we repent. Maybe you're here and you're on a journey and you haven't even discovered or said yes to Jesus. What, how does your life become Christ centered? Well, you say yes to him. You recognize that he became the ultimate sacrifice for you. So you can have the ultimate life. So you can live in a relationship with a God who, who longs to be in relationship with you, who actually went through a great did something outstanding that sent his only son so he can be in relationship with you. That's how much God loves you. So we just got to be real. And I think for all of us taking a moment this morning, regardless of why we're here, where we invited, but looking at our heart and saying, am I Christ centered? Am I Christ centered? Is Jesus the center of everything that I'm doing? And if he's not, then I want to have a moment. I want to repent and say, God, I'm sorry. God, I am so sorry. So I want to do this. I want us all to stand and we're going to pray together. I think there's going to be married couples here today who recognize and that you've been calling yourself a Christian really just because you go to church. And you're going to start to begin to center your life around something that matters, something that's bigger. You're going to center your marriage around something that's bigger. Your relationships, you're going to center them around something that's bigger. I think for some of us today in this room that recognize that we're not a follower of Christ, we're going to step into something that's bigger. And so this is what I want to do. I want to keep it simple for everybody. Usually we pray and then we do something else and we pray again. I just want to keep it simple for everybody. Today in this room, I don't care if you're married. I don't care if you're engaged. I don't care if you're dating. I don't care if you're single. Today in this room, if you would say, my life is not Christ-centered, I want to change that. I want you to raise your hand if there's anybody. Yeah, thank you. A a whole lot of hands going up. I'm so thankful for God's mercy and his grace. And so we're going to pray. And then we're going to pray together that today it changes. Today we put Jesus where he belongs, at the center of our life. Father, we're just so thankful for today, for your mercy and your grace. God, I'm thankful for what you are doing in our midst. And we just continue to say yes. And so, Lord, we recognize today that you're not at the center. 
where you should be. And forgive us even for filling our life with, our, with good things. But are actually robbing us and, and actually hurting our relationships over helping them. And so Jesus, we want you to be at the center today. Forgive us for filling our lives with a whole lot of stuff that doesn't matter. And today we make the choice just to say yes to you. Let's all pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, Jesus forgive, me forgive me for not having you at the center. Today, today I, surrender I surrender everything, everything to you. Jesus. I ask that you would forgive me you of my sin. my sin. Today, today I'm making the choice to live for you, to put you at the center of my life. My life is not my own. I give it to you. In your wonderful name, I pray. And everybody said, amen. Yeah.